Okay, for those of you less familiar with it, STITCH is an acronym for the surgical treatment of ischemic heart failure. It's a $45 million study that was undertaken uh, to determine um, the outcome of ventricular reduction surgery uh, with or without accompanying cabbage. I have two initial, qu two initial questions to ask. The first is, uh, I'm familiar with the conclusions of the STITCH trial comparing the efficacy of SVR plus cabbage with cabbage alone as published in the New England Journal of Medicine. If you are, raise your hand. And if you're not, be honest, raise your hand. I'm not, I'm not so sure of them myself, it's okay. Um, and the second question is, knowledge of the outcome of the STITCH trial has influenced my practice. If the answer is yes, raise your hand. Interesting. Hasn't changed anyone's practice. And the other answer is no, it hasn't affected your practice. So I'm going to speak a little bit from a highly biased viewpoint about the STITCH trial. There was a brief period of time that I was the surgical director for the trial, and I actually chose to remove myself because I didn't agree with the organization of the trial which I thought was a surgical trial weighted heavily in favor of medical management. And 10 years later, I think that proved prophetic. The fundamental tenet of the STITCH trial is that it, it tries to capture uh, some of earlier observations made in medical patients. The key observation being that for patients who had an acute myocardial infarction, the end systolic volume of at the, the end systolic volume index after either one month or one year was highly predictive of the probability of mortality in those patients, or to say it much more simply, ventricular dilatation after acute myocardial infarction is bad. Uh, the primary, uh, there were several objectives in the STITCH trial, but the one we're most interested in, was, and I'm, this is quoted literally from the trial, was designed to test the hypothesis that in patients with anterior left ventricular akinesia, optimization of left ventricular shape and size by surgical ventricular restoration combined with cabbage and medical therapy improves long-term survival free of cardiac hospitalization compared to cabbage and medical therapy without SVR. This slide is a Gadolinian scan. Uh, the delayed scan is shown on the right, and the non-Gadolinian component is shown on the left. The scar here, shown in the enhanced scan, is very typical what a patient who is imaged late after an acute anterior myocardial infarction would look like, where there's a dense scar that occupies most of the wall thickness of the anterior wall. And you can plot that out as surface area of the anterior wall, uh, volume of the ventricle affected. Now, as simplistic as it might sound, in this uh, MRI study, the question in the STITCH trial was, does a heart that looks like the one on the left improve or stay the same when you convert it to one that looks like the one on the right. Excuse me for saying this is kind of obvious. Uh, or you can look at it if you're more familiar with uh, ventriculograms. This would be prior to ventricular reconstruction on the left and after ventricular reconstruction on the right. If you like uh, diagrams, what the STITCH trial really asks is whether a patient that's moved far out on the, on the pressure volume curve uh, with a high end diastolic volume here, a reduced stroke volume here, and a diminished end systolic pressure volume index as a measure of contractility um, can be made to assume a more normal configuration, not by medical therapy, which, after all, this is the goal of all of the principles of medical treatment of heart failure, but whether you can do this acutely with a surgical intervention that um, reduces the size of the left ventricle and modifies its shape. This, uh, these two slides taken from Jerry Buckberg uh, simply show the 
the goal of the stitch trial. This is all the anterior scar represented here in a cross section of the ventricle. And basically, you just pull healthy heart muscle uh, to healthy heart muscle at the level of the interventricular septum. And sometimes when there's a great deal of muscle has to be removed and there's a danger of making the ventricular dimension too small, you can interpose, as shown here, a patch because you do want to gauge the size of the left ventricle to some measured parameter, usually a, uh, an end diastolic volume index. The inclusion criteria for the STITCH trial seem pretty straightforward. The patient had to have symptomatic heart failure, class 2 to 4, within three months prior to entry in the study. The left ventricular ejection fraction had to be less than 35%. The coronary anatomy had to be suitable for grafting, which is very important inclusion criterion because there are a number of patients who have large areas of ventricular A or dyssynergy who, in fact, do not have a left anterior descending coronary artery suitable for grafting. There had to be measured akinesia greater than 35 percent of the left anterior free wall, and the end systolic volume index had to exceed 60 milliliters per meter squared, which if you're not used to using that term, that's about twice normal. Uh, the volume had to be determined by some accurate measure of volume determination, either um, computerized scans or magnetic resonance imaging, ventriculography, or as assessed by the echocardiographic core lab, the latter being very important because it's difficult to assess volumes in these greatly misshapen ventricles. And the goal was to enroll 500 patients in each arm of the study. Uh, half of them would undergo coronary bypass grafting alone. The other half would undergo coronary bypass grafting plus ventricular restoration surgery. And as you can see, when the study was set up, it was to involve 1,000 patients at 50 United States centers and three European centers. The results of this uh, study were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, coronary bypass surgery with the wet, without surgical ventricular reconstruction. The entire article is well summed up in a single curve. Here you can see the Kaplan-Meier estimates uh, for the primary endpoint, uh, which was death or rehospitalization for heart failure. Uh, you can see the event rates between the two groups five years after randomization and they're completely superimposable one on the other. And the conclusion from that study was that adding surgical ventricular reconstruction to cabbage reduced the left ventricular volume as compared with cabbage alone. However, this anatomic change was not associated with greater improvement in symptoms of ex or exercise tolerance uh, or reduction in the rate of death or hospitalization for cardiac causes. Uh, in other words, there was no reason to uh, do ventricular reconstructive surgery in these patients. Well, remember the original study design. The same 1,000 patients were required, but enrollment was so difficult in this particular study that the number of clinical sites uh, spread from 50 clinical sites to 96 clinical sites. And instead of being, uh, instead of 90% of the sites being from the United States with some European sites, in fact, uh, there were 23 countries involved, and it took almost three, it took almost four years to complete enrollment in this study. Interestingly, um, of those patients enrolled in the study, you can see the end systolic volume index was the same for both groups, about 82. It's not a huge ventricle, but definitely a very enlarged ventricle. But interestingly, only a, about half the patients met the criterion for anterior wall with akinesia or dyskinesia of the extent that was des built into the study design. This is the first red flag in the study. The other interesting thing is that only about three-quarters of the patients in both groups um, actually had an LAD lesion of 75 percent or greater, 
which is consistent with the observation that there was not a strong element of anterior akinesia or dyskinesia in the study group, but also that there may have been freedom from involvement of the left anterior descending coronary artery. Now here's what the two groups look like in, in four important categories. Those of you who've had a lot of experience dealing with patients who have had the need for ventricular reconstructive surgery know that angin is actually a relatively infrequent accompaniment uh, for these patients. Most of them have a completed coronary lesion. They're not acutely ischemic. And after all, this was designed to be a heart failure study, not an ischemia study, and not a revascularization study. But here, if you look at the distribution of angina in, in both study groups, you see that there was a very high uh, incidence of a high level of angina, ergo ongoing ischemia, uh, in both groups. This once again points out the fact that many of these patients were operated on the conditions, under conditions of either chronic or relatively subacute ischemia as compared with predominantly heart failure. About half the patients were in class three to four congestive heart failure, with many patients in class two and a couple of patients in class one. Once again, forgetting the outcome of the surgery, um, for those who routinely do ventricular reconstructive surgery, it's uncommon to have half of your patients be in New York Heart Association functional class two. Most of these patients have rather severe congestive heart failure. And in fact, this was supposed to be a heart failure study, yet less than half the patients had severe heart failure as we would define it. This is perhaps the most telling and important slide and, and aspect of the study. On the left is seen the end systolic volume index for those patients who had cabbage versus those patients in the cabbage plus ventricular reconstruction group. And on the right is shown the effect of the intervention, either cabbage alone or ventricular reconstruction plus cabbage on the end systolic volume index. You have a significant reduction in end systolic volume index in the uh, ventricular reconstruction plus cabbage group. However, the extent of this volume reduction is in fact very, very small. Patients who had bypass grafting alone had a six milliliter reduction in end systolic volume index. Those who had ventricular reconstructive surgery had a 19 millimeter milliliter difference. The difference between the two is about 13 milliliters. This is a very statistically significant, but, but clinically very small reduction in end systolic volume index. And in fact, if you look at the end systolic volume index of patients after having had ventricular reconstructive surgery, on the mean, these patients were once again candidates for further ventricular reconstructive surgery. And here, in fact, are the results of the STITCH trial shown in red on the far right in terms of the percentage of left ventricular end systolic volume reduction uh, compared with a series of observational studies published in the literature, some quite large. And you can see that the amount of volume reduction was about half that obtained uh, in the hands of experienced surgeons performing this operation. There's also a strong selection bias in this study, as can be the case with randomized trials, in that subsequent to publication of the trial and interviews of surgeons who contributed patients to the study, uh, surgeons oftentimes held back those patients that they believed would be most benefited by ventricular reconstructive surgery and tend to include it in the study, those patients that they thought were rather marginal. Sorry. So the last couple of slides I'd like to show you, this is a, the group from Milan that have been, have been very active in this particular operation. And they looked at end systolic 
volume following ventricular reconstructive surgery. And what I want to point out is here is the survival curve. I don't know if that arrow is showing. Yeah. Anyway, in the upper part of the slide, in, in the green line, you can see the survival curve for patients whose end systolic volume index after ventricular reconstructive surgery, not patients in the STITCH trial, was less than 60 milliliters uh, per meter squared. And in the blue, you can see the uh, survival rate for those patients who had end systolic volume indices of greater than 60 milliliters. I'm sorry, they're reversed. One is the probability of death as an event, and the other is uh, for the patients with large hearts and the probability of the event for patients with small hearts. If your end systolic volume index was greater than 60 milliliters per, min per meter squared, you had a much higher probability of not surviving than if you were reduced appropriately to below 60. And if you look at the volumes that were obtained in the STITCH trial, they did not come anywhere near the volume reduction that others have demonstrated is associated with an improved long-term outcome. So in summary, what, what did happen to the STITCH trial? Well, the primary purpose of the trial was to see if volume reduction and shape normalization added to cabbage was beneficial. The surgical volume reduction was inadequate. The trial shifted from a heart failure trial to an ischemia trial. The critical, the, cl the critical entry criterion of an end systolic volume index switched to ejection fraction. Patients were, in, were enrolled in the study by an ejection fraction less than 35%, more so than by having an increased end systolic volume index. There was selection bias in terms of the patients who were enrolled in the study. And because of the large number of centers that were involved in the trial, the need to go outside of the country and to more or less do this operation by relatively inexperienced surgeons in many cases, not all, the average number of ventricular reconstruction cases that were performed were about two per year per center, which relates very much to the discussions we had earlier this morning about what skill level or what frequency do you need to do things like off-pump bypasses and bilateral IMAs to have predictably good outcomes. And finally, a quarter of the patients involved in the trial did not have important left anterior descending disease. So this is a very expensive study designed as a prospectively randomized clinical trial. It met the enrollment criteria in terms of number, but I believe generated uh, results of very, very little clinical importance to us. That's my own bias. Thank you. Time for a few questions. I think we've got Professor Dagger. Yeah. Andrew, lovely talk. In fact, when you said it generated results which are very little relevance to us, it's even worse than that. Yeah. It means the cardiologists have taken this, as usual misinterpreted it, and used it to deny patients who really would benefit the, op the opportunity to have this operation. So it's been worse than just a neutral finding. I think it's been positively harmful. And the recurrent theme of today, as we go from on-pump to off-pump, PCI versus cabbage to the STITCH trial, is how much more uneasy one comes with randomized trials. Because the repeated theme of today for off-pump, for PCI versus cabbage, and for STITCH was that they had all addressed the wrong populations. And yet they've had the results, which have now all been generalized to the whole population. And how, how we try and fix this, I'm not sure. But I think it's worse than just being a neutral result. Thanks for your comments, David. I obviously agree with them all. One, one of the other myths that circulates in this environment is that with the advent of uh, PCI, an early balloon angioplasty or stent implantation for <clears throat> acute myocardial infarction, the problem of the dilated ventricle has gone away. <laughs> 
And in fact, there's been an excellent study that came from Italy which demonstrates that at least one-third of patients who are followed out for a year, which is oftentimes not done, normally you may get a PCI and you disappear into the wilderness, but for patients who are followed out at least to a year, over 30% of those patients experience ventricular dilatation. And if you follow those patients longer out, they have a shortened lifespan. And that's the very population that this trial has denied uh, operation to. Andy? I, um, <clears throat> as much as I like to blame the, the cardiologist, David, uh, for everything, um, there's some element of, of the fault at our feet in this trial, too. Um, it's, it's striking to me that the same complaints that we can lodge um, about this trial can be said about, about uh, lung volume reduction or the external carotid to internal carotid bypass study. Randomized surgical studies, oftentimes, it was one of your bullet points, surgeons don't enroll the patients that will most benefit, and so we're destined to keep doing studies that show no benefit. Um, it's part of, part of the, the fault, dear Brutus, lies not in the stars but in ourselves, I think. Absolutely correct, and, and the fundamental tenet of the trial as it was designed was that there was equipoise within the medical and surgical community over whether adding ventricular reconstruction to cabbage was beneficial or not. In truth, there was a lot less equipoise than was postulated, and the only way equipoise was found was to go into less sophisticated environments to find the patients. So that's a great point you make, but in fact, where the mistake lies is the projection of the trials and I tried to draw this out by saying to you, in Excel, for example, we had four long one and a half hour conversations with the cardiologist before Excel started. And every time they said to us, no, so I kept saying, we can only do this trial if we see no patients with a syntax score above 32. And the cardiologist didn't want that. So uh, they kept saying, no, we'll come up with a long list of exclusions. So we, the sergeants, would then discuss it, and I'd say, we're walking towards a cliff edge. What they're going to do is do what they've done before, do low-risk patients, and then present it as it applies to everyone. So before the fourth call, so we had three long calls, I phoned the other, I happened to be fortunately the chairman of the surgical committee, so I phoned the other seven sergeants, and I said, I want you to agree with me that on the fourth call we have with the cardiologist, we say, unless you stipulate that inclusion of patients with a syntax score above 32 is an exclusion. There is no Excel trial. It's off, or at least it's off with us. So in our fourth call, it started, and again we said, inclusion, exclusion, and I said, look, we can ha make this conversation very fast tonight because we, the sergeants, have discussed it, and basically if you don't agree to syntax above 32 being an exclusion, there is no Excel trial. We, or at least there's not with this group of sergeants. There was about a 10-second pause, and then they said, okay. <laughs> but, but the point I'm making is, so we, so there's nothing wrong with that trial that was done as long as it's badged properly for what it is. And the deception that occurred before with all the previous trials of PCI versus cabbage, where the cardiologists knew exactly what patients they'd studied, they knew what their results meant, but it was the way they were allowed to generalize this for financial reasons, both for companies and often personally, to generalize these results into the whole population. So it's not a matter of not doing these, it's a matter of making sure that when the trials are instituted, that they're badged for what they are and not, and you're badged in a way that they cannot then be generalized to everyone. We can agree to disagree. <laughs> Yes. Enormous credit to the but right. that, that's a story I said that that's what we were going to do with Excel as well for the very same reason. You can yeah. see the way you were being manipulated and so, so you have the combination of study design has to be fair and appropriate. And if you're gonna go head to get head to head against another group, 
you've got to do it using the very best that you have at your disposal. That, that's an obligation that's incumbent upon all of us when we participate in studies. Andy, Andy, Andy can I just ask, uh, you've beautifully um, uh, evaluated the, the stitch to limb. Can you just in a few bullet points just explain the results of the stitch, of how, how stitch one should influence um, current surgical practice? Um, I would say not at all. If, <laughs> if you have a patient that you are uncertain whether they have an enlarged ventricle or not, you shouldn't reduce it. But if you have a patient that meets the criteria that to date, I'm afraid we have to rely on observational studies that have shown great benefit I believe that you should offer that patient ventricular restoration surgery. We have so few options to offer to patients who have congestive heart failure. I mean, we talk about it a lot, and we talk about valve replacements and functional mitral repairs and obviously transplants and ventricular assist devices and low ejection fraction, low uh, gradient aortic stenosis. But this is one of those outstanding examples where you can quantitatively and qualitatively take a patient who is class four and convert them to class one by an appropriate operation. And so I would caution you not, not to abandon this operation or can, and, and to educate your cardiologists. Thank you. Well, if there are no more questions, I think we've uh, completed the day's activities. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming and thank all the speakers again. Uh,